Welcome to the Ash Cloud. I'm Ash Sweeting. Today we are joined by Terry McCosker, a pioneer of regenerative agriculture. For the last five and a half decades, Terry has been working with farmers and ranchers across Australia and around the world to improve sustainability and livelihoods. We now have a much better understanding that management of our resource is more important than the development of it. And so we had from, you know, out of the 50 odd years of experience that I've got in the beginning of that period for at least half of it, um, the paradigm was about development. The paradigm has shifted uh, in probably the last 25, 15 to 25 years towards now managing what you develop much more effectively. It's all about people. It's a human issue we've got, not an ecological issue, not a climate issue. It's a human issue. And it's all right for governments or anybody, you know, somebody like me to say, well, we need to change this, this, that, and the other thing. But it's every individual farmer is the one who makes the change. And unless we bring them on that journey, uh, it, won't, it won't happen. Nature is primary. We're managing an ecosystem. And... If we manage that ecosystem well and work with Mother Nature to manage that ecosystem, then she will help us. She'll actually help us. She'll improve the water cycle. She'll improve the mineral cycle. She will improve succession. Uh, She'll get more carbon in the soil. Uh, All these good things actually happen. There are long-established practices that must be made redundant. The paradigm at that stage was continuous grazing and the science said continuous grazing. But landscape was deteriorating under continuous grazing and farmers knew it. Um, And scientists considered that's just normal. There's nothing we can do about that. And so grazing management started to become a thing then in the 90s. Uh, So when I started down this process in, say, say 1990, um, you could nearly count on one hand in Australia the number of beef producers that were moving animals in any form of rotation. And if they were, it was a very basic uh, rotation rather than a, than a good grazing management system. Now, the, the AB figures are probably showing that it's up around 60-odd percent. New practices must be profitable to be sustainable. We have uh, got the first um, high... Uh, integrity soil carbon credits in the world in the last two months. And that was done in the real world over large scale. So it was 13,000 hectares across five properties. Um, and it was a, the first tranche of those was 150,000 tonnes of CO2 or ACUs. Um, and there's another 100,000 coming through the system at the moment. So, and that in today's uh, value, is, is about $9 million additional income to four of those properties that will get credits this year. Um, that's significant. And what our data has shown is that the value of that carbon in terms of net profit uh, is, is worth two to four times the net profit earned from livestock in the same period. The road ahead is long. Oh, there's massive amounts to be done. Um, I think that there's probably, you know, if you put it on a spectrum and said, what's the absolute ideal in terms of landscape management, ecological management, grazing management, business management, we're probably somewhere up to about 5% um, of property managers that are in that category. Um, but that's not to discount that a lot of others are already started to move in this direction. We need to become smarter. It's actually an education, um, but the right form. Of, but it's a holistic form of education that, that brings together the understanding of ecosystem, production, uh, people, business, all of those things coming together. Um, if I was to wave a magic wand over Australia or anywhere else, I would probably say that, you know, if the federal government or state governments between them allocated somewhere between 50 and $100 million over the next uh, five to 10 years into education and support of 
practice change on landscapes in Australia, we could get it up into probably the 30% range fairly quickly. Strategic patience is essential and delivers results. What we found was that in the first year to two years, there was very little practice change because firstly, it was getting into the business. Then it's getting into goals and visions and getting communications and families and businesses on the same page. Once you understand the business, um, you can start to get confidence in bringing about change. And we found that there wasn't any change until there was confidence in the business and the, where we were going, and the whole team was on board. Uh, once we'd achieved that, that away we went. And in the last two years of that project, uh, those producers spent $23 million of their own money on water and wire and development to, to bring about the practice change on a large scale. So... You know, the, the, the government's bet $3 million over five years. Impact is not necessarily expensive. It's quite easy in a lot of businesses to get early wins that don't actually cost you capital. Um, so by fixing up nutrition in your, in your livestock, which is, you know, there's a lot of nutrition that's done wrong um, and, and money wasted. If you, you fix that up or even tighten up reproduction, when you know when you're making and think the simple stuff like that, which you don't have to go out and spend money to do. There are no shortcuts. People think that if you go out and run a course and you teach somebody something, that's going to bring about change. It doesn't. <clears throat> it's that building of confidence. It's the support and it's the building of skills. And the skills and confidence take time to build. And so you've got to stay with them which is generally about a four or five year journey. Context is everything. But when, but when we put carbon in soil, it's worth far more than carbon in a tree. And the reason is to do with the relationship between soil organic carbon and water. Now, when you look at um, the greenhouse effect, about 70% of the greenhouse effect is due to water vapour. 25% of it is due to CO2. For every tonne of carbon we store in the soil, we store between four and 10 tonnes of water. One tonne of organic carbon stored in soil is equivalent to 20 tonnes of CO2 pulled out of the air in terms of its heating capacity. Now you haven't pulled 20 tonnes of CO2 out of the air, but you've changed the heating capacity of the atmosphere by the equivalent of at least 20 tonnes of CO2. What's been the greatest area of success over your career? Certainly genetics have changed significantly uh, in across most breeds uh, and in, on most properties. The quality of meat that we're getting now, you know, if you went to a pub 25, 30 years ago and asked for a steak, it was 50-50 probability whether you could eat it or not. Now uh, it's pretty well 100%. Terry, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Ash. It's a pleasure. Terry, you have been working in the livestock industry for many decades, let's just put it that way, and you've had great uh, experience but also visibility uh, about how the industry has changed over that time. And I'd first like to start off with your thoughts in in terms of given your knowledge of the industry of the challenges we're facing be that economic be that environmental and climate what do you think the industry is doing well where do you think we're getting it right i think it's certainly changed you know it's actually five and a half decades since i started professionally in the industry and if i think back to the beginning we had uh, very poor uh, very poor genetics. Um, we had low productivity. Uh, we had very poor management of droughts and livestock generally. We had poor road infrastructure. Uh, we had low efficiency meatworks. Uh, we really didn't have a feedlot industry 50 years ago. Um, 
So there's a lot has changed since then. You know, we have we have some good roads now. We have very good transport, uh, so animals can go a fairly long distance fairly quickly. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a, a viable feedlot industry. We have some large scale and, and you know, big business feedlots can, can handle the downturns. You know, one of the problems in the meat industry is there's periods when processors actually lose a lot of money. And then there's there's periods when they make a lot of money. And I don't think the production sector, sector actually realises uh, how much risk there is in the processing and the, the meat sales sector. Uh, so that's uh, you know that's gone quite well I think the the um, certainly genetics have changed significantly uh, in across most breeds uh, and in on most properties the quality of meat that we're getting now you know if you went to a pub 25 30 years ago and asked for a steak it was 50 50 probability whether you could eat it or not now uh, it's pretty well hundred percent probability that you're going to get something that's palatable and uh, it, you know it's not tough and it tastes good um, and it's good for you so I think the quality of meat at the consumer end has changed significantly that that's been assisted by the feedlot industry as well uh, and uh, a better knowledge uh, of production systems uh, tightening up production systems so tightening up reproduction getting rid of you know, a lot of the waste that was in the industry. Um, you know, back then, uh, calving rates were probably 50, 60%. You know, when I think back 50 years ago, um, now in, in the better regions in Australia, more endowed regions, it's probably 90 plus percent. Uh, in the north, uh, it's still quite low. It's still around 50%. Um, but that's uh, there's a lot of good work going on with genetics now that, that are starting to change that. Uh, and I think that um, there's also been some downsides and, and one of those has been the loss of people from the industry. Uh, there's been a lot of property amalgamation, families disappeared out of districts, schools closed, communities shutting down. That's the bad side of, of what's happened, I think, in the last 50 years. Uh, you know, there used to be tennis clubs everywhere and then even on properties uh, you know, and, uh, and sporting events and so on. And I think that that's, that's waned a little bit. Um, on the flip side of that, though, accommodation has had to improve on properties to attract and retain staff. So now, you know, uh, if you're looking for people to go onto a property to work for you now, generally they're interviewing you. Um, not you interviewing them and they'll decide whether they like the sound of you or the look of you or what you're offering before they'll take the job. And, you know, there's the labour is so scarce that that's where the, the boot is actually on the other foot. And, I, and to some extent, that's not a bad thing because some of the living conditions really did need to improve. And not just for employees, but also for families. Um, and I think that's another thing that, that has improved, you know, um, the, the living conditions on most properties now are, are much better than they were. Uh, you know, I grew up on the land uh, and I left home 56 years ago, but uh, we had no electricity then. We had no running water in the house and that was common. Um, you know, I, and at one stage we moved to a place that was only an hour out of Brisbane in 1963. We still had no electricity. Uh, we didn't get that until about 65, I think it was. Uh, so living conditions have significantly improved. So, yeah, I think uh, in lots of aspects we've improved. In, in terms of those improvements, you mentioned things like uh, genetics, management of drought, uh, the, the um, feedlot industry, uh, the meat processing sector, the productivity on farms. From what you've seen, where do you see the, I guess the best word I can think of is the mechanisms that drove that, whether that was, you know, was it government extension? Was it market forces? Was it entrepreneurial zeal? Was it something else? Uh, certainly across Northern Australia, it was the BTEC program in the 80s that actually 
uh, forced people to start building yards and fences and paddocks and being able to muster animals and, and get them back in again. Um, that was the biggest catalyst for the change in Northern Australia. Uh, I think in in Southern Australia, it's it's land prices. Um, you know, we, we also went through the, the 70s beef slump, which put um, a lot of pressure on a lot of businesses. We were very, very fortunate that those years where we had the beef slump were also some of our wettest years on record. And because the people weren't selling anything, the herd was just building and building and building. But um, and a lot of land was actually able to carry it because because of the rain. We we're very very fortunate with that, but that was a wake up call for for a lot of people. Um, through that period, I've been in the game long enough to be in on the, the fertilizer and pasture improvement era of the sixties and seventies and eighties. Um, I think we're past that. Uh, we've we've moved on from that now and. We now have a much better understanding that management of our resource is more important than the development of it. And so we had from, you know, out of the 50 odd years of experience that I've got in the beginning of that period for at least half of it, um, the paradigm was about development. The paradigm has shifted uh, in probably the last 25, 15 to 25 years towards now managing what you develop much more effectively um, and that's in terms of pastures and fertilizers and all sorts of things um, so i'd say the the beef slump was a catalyst for some of that change um, and uh, the i think market forces and then land values so as land values increase uh, and then in the 80s we had very high interest rates up around 18 to 22 percent that also caused people to really rethink uh, what they were doing. And then we had from, from the 80s through the 90s, 2000s, and are still going, a series of quite severe droughts. And I know in the 80s there was landscape that did not recover from the management it got in the 80s. And by the time we got into the early 90s drought, a lot of graziers were starting to say, you know, we don't want to do that again. We know our land, our carrying capacity is declining. The total pastures we're running are declining. Um, and we don't want to go back there again. And so there are people in the 90s then were quite open to looking at some change uh, and particularly grazing management. So when I started in the, in the grazing teaching people about different ways of grazing in 89 and, and 90. We, we kicked off in those two years. And the paradigm at that stage was continuous grazing and the science said continuous grazing. But landscape was deteriorating under continuous grazing and farmers knew it. Um, and scientists considered that's just normal. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, but it was a cost to farmers. And I'd say this was a, these droughts in the 80s and 90s were probably a catalyst for change in Southern Australia. And so grazing management started to become a thing then in the 90s uh, and in the early 2000s and still is. Um, so when I started down this process in say, say 1990, um, you could nearly count on one hand in Australia the number of beef producers that were moving animals in any form of rotation. And if they were, it was a very basic uh, rotation rather than a, than a good grazing management system. Now, the, the AB figures are probably showing that it's up around 60 odd percent of graziers in Australia now are using some form of, of rotation in their management. And that's a, that's a massive shift uh, in, you know, in only 30 years. So I think, um, there's that that has been a, a significant change that has also started to bring about a lot more change in looking and thinking about management from the environmental perspective one of the things that we've been teaching now for 30 odd years nearly 35 years now is um, that we're managing an ecosystem and if we manage that ecosystem well and work with mother nature to manage that ecosystem, 
then she will help us. She'll actually help us. She'll improve the water cycle. She'll improve the mineral cycle. Um, she will improve succession. Uh, she will get more carbon in the soil. Uh, all these good things actually happen. And so through the 90s and, and early 2000s, we were able to demonstrate that all over Australia on landscape <clears throat> with real people doing real things. And so I think there's more interest in that now. And probably in the last 10 years, there's been increased interest in getting income from that change in natural capital. And uh, just recently, which I'm happy to talk about as well, is the we have uh, got the first um, high uh, integrity soil carbon credits in the world in the last two months. And that was done in the real world over large scale. So it was 13,000 hectares across five properties. Um, and it was a, the first tranche of those was 150,000 tonnes of CO2 or ACUs. Um, and there's another 100,000 coming through the system at the moment. So, and that in today's uh, value is, is about $9 million additional income to four of those properties that will get credits this year. Um, that's significant. And what our data has shown is that the value of that carbon in terms of net profit uh, is, is worth two to four times the net profit earned from livestock in the same period. So the period those were earned was from 2016 to 2021. Um, so there's, I think there's more interest generally in that, the environment. And then as we change the ecosystem, you know, are there ecosystem services that we can monetize? In terms of the, you know, there's some impressive uh, achievements there, zero to uh, sixty percent in terms of rotational grazing, and the, you know, the move into carbon credits and environmental management in in a in an ecosystem a much more holistic way, is from a from a very if you if you take the high level view, and obviously there's the leaders who are who are making real changes, doing things very very well, but if you look across the industry as a whole. You know, are we in the situation where we should be packing it, patting ourselves on the back and saying we're doing a pretty good job, or is is there still a lot more work to be done? Oh, there's massive amounts to be done. Um, I think that there's probably, you know, if you put it on a spectrum and said what's the absolute ideal in terms of landscape management, ecological management, grazing management, business management, we're probably somewhere up to about five percent um, of property managers that are in that category. Um, but that's not to discount that a lot of others are already started to move in this direction. Um, I'm hoping that things like monetizing carbon and, and perhaps natural capital as well and, and ecosystem services on top of carbon over the next five to 10 years will actually encourage more people to lift the game because to be able to, particularly with carbon, to be able to sequester carbon, you've got to be on top of the game. Um, it, it's not going to happen by itself. So there's, there's sort of two aspects to the soil carbon story. One is being able to measure it accurately, which we can now do. But the, the really key is, can you actually sequester it and keep it there? And that takes pretty good management. Um, the managers on the properties that uh, where we've done this large-scale experimental work we're all, I would put them in that 5% um, of top line managers. And so they've managed the drought because we went through a very severe drought in that period. Um, they managed the drought well. They destocked. They didn't hang on. They maintained ground cover. Their country responded very quickly to rain uh, when it did rain. They didn't destock too quickly. They allowed the country, you know, time to recover uh, before. Uh, they had the stock back on it again. So, uh, and that cost them a lot in terms of their production business, which I think is one of the reasons why the car their carbon business has has been a lot more profitable than their production business, uh, because they were, you know, there was one property was totally destocked uh, for about a year, um, 
There was another one that was right down to, I think he had between 60 and 80 head and normally carries between two and 3,000. Like, so it was a severe drought. Uh, plus on top of that drought, we had um, uh, pasture dieback, which really knocked the, the country around pretty badly. So I think given that we had out of a five-year measurement period, we had two years of one of the worst droughts in 100 years. We had pasture dieback. Um, one of those properties had two floods and one of them was completely burnt out in the 2019 bushfires. So this trial had everything thrown at it that the Australian bush can throw at it uh, and still they've sequestered carbon. But the overarching overarching reason why they did was the quality of the management. So we've got, you know, a fairly long way to go to to improve to that level. But I think that this hopefully will incentivize more people um, to be able to manage at that sort of level. The COVID outbreak <clears throat> three years ago or so now, and the response to that and the development of vaccines shows that if leaders, governments, you know, the leading parts of the private sector and researchers decide that something is a priority and prioritise significant resources, we have the ability as humans to make rapid change and rapid developments very, very quickly and very successfully. And obviously the climate issues are just as real as COVID. What do you think governments, researchers, um, the private sector and the industry as a whole would need? What tools or what programs or incentives or education or whatever it is that they would need to get that? Even you said it was about 5%. If we even to get up to 40, 50% in terms of people doing the right management, where's the priorities there? It's actually an education, um, but the right form. It's a holistic form of education that, that brings together the understanding of ecosystem, production, uh, people, business, all of those things coming together. Um, if I was to wave a magic wand over Australia or anywhere else, I would probably say that, you know, if the federal government or state governments between them allocated somewhere between 50 and $100 million over the next uh, five to 10 years into education and support of practice change on landscapes in Australia, we could get it up into probably the 30% range fairly quickly. And once you get past 20 odd percent, then things are normalised and you know, uh, practice change happens much more quickly across the industry. So to me, the really critical number is how do we get from, uh, say, a bit under 5% to just over 20% very quickly. And that's education. Um, and what we we did a another very large scale project for the federal government a few years ago, uh, where we took um, 100 producers on 1.3 million hectares. And if, over a five year period, the government spent $3.3 .3 million on education and solely on education, spent nothing on the property, was all in developing the people. And what we found was that in the first year to two years, there was very little practice change because firstly, it was getting into the business. Then it's getting into goals and visions and getting communications and families and businesses on the same page. Once you understand the business, um, you can start to get confidence in bringing about change. And we found that there wasn't any change until there was confidence in the business and the, where we were going and the whole team was on board. Uh, once we'd achieved that, that away we went. And in the last two years of that project, uh, those producers spent $23 million of their own money on water and wire and development to to bring about the practice change on a large scale. So, you know, the, the, the government spent $3 million over five years. They spent some of their own money on that training and development as well. But it showed that as we, as the confidence and support level in that built, then they are prepared to 
really suck it up and go and and borrowed a lot of that money to do that development because they, by that stage they had the confidence um, and the clear direction. So that's actually what it takes. It takes that. Um, it's a human issue we've got, not an ecological issue, not a climate issue. It's a human issue. And it's all right for governments or anybody, you know, somebody like me to say, well, we need to change this, this, that, and the other thing. But it's every individual farmer is the one who makes the change. And unless we bring them on that journey, uh, it won't it won't happen. And it's that um, change and that shift is not having fast enough. Um, but we know how to do it. We've done it. We've proven it can be done. Um, and we've done it over a long period of time. So that bit, I think, is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then that can be monetized with carbon and you know, other uh, ways of funding the development that are not based on food production. Would, would it be wrong to say that with those people who are trying to push change, they're the ones that need a bit more strategic patience and resilience to actually spend that time, because you said it took two or three years to build the confidence uh, to get people, because obviously if you're confident that something's going to work, you you will approach it with much more enthusiasm and persistence mm. and and attention. Um, is that is that a wrong way to think about it? No, it's very right. Um, in fact, what we found was that the bureaucrats involved in this funding, um, they were quite concerned for the first two years because nothing they couldn't see any change happening on the ground. Um, but they learnt that um, you know there's debt issues in families, there's succession issues in families, there's um, there's all sorts of there's lack of clarity, there's lack of direction. That's what holds things up, uh, and they're all human issues. Uh, the monetary is not quite human, but the you know but overcoming it and understanding the strengths and weakness of a business, and then how do we focus up the business, and then. It's quite easy in a lot of businesses to get early wins that don't actually cost you capital. Um, so by fixing up nutrition in your, in your livestock, which is, you know, there's a lot of nutrition that's done wrong um, and, and money wasted. If you, you fix that up or even tighten up reproduction when, you know, when you're making and think the simple stuff like that, which you don't have to go out and spend money to do, uh, changing the type of bulls you're buying so that you really shifting those genetics in your herd um, or rams, whether you're whether in sheep or not. And so that um, those there's early wins that can be made, but people are not going to go and borrow that $23 million to do the rest of it until there's a clear direction, there's confidence, and everybody in the team's on board with it. Uh, and also uh, there's – it's who's the decision maker sometimes. So – Often the younger generation is ready for these changes, but the older generation holds the checkbook and they've been successful in the past and so we'll just keep doing what we've always done. Um, you know, we're not into all this new fancy stuff and, and so on. So that, and those things take time and sometimes they never shift, but if they do shift, they take time. <clears throat> and so there has to be patience. But on my numbers, if we were to, get just 20% of the better quality grazing land in Australia uh, under uh, good grazing management in the higher rainfall, that's in the higher rainfall zones, we could offset 20% uh, of Australia's emissions every year just with soil carbon sequestration. And that's not counting what we could then do with vegetation and other stuff on top of that. So, you know, the if climate change is an imperative, then there's something that we could do. And, and you know, if for an investment of maybe up to $100 million over the next five to 10 years, you could actually achieve that uh, within the 10-year time frame. So it, it's all possible. We know how to do it. Um, but we've got to go to the individuals that, that are the ones that have to do it uh, and they have to be on board. Why, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying and I think it makes a lot of sense. 
um, so this is a bit of a devil's advocate but question, but if we know that education is critical, we know that, you know, given the size of the industry, that's, you know, it's a big sum of money, but it's not um, exorbitant. Why do you think it's not being done? That's a really good question. And it's not through lack of asking and it's not through lack of effort. Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had a very successful education program in Australia called Farm Biz. And uh, I've worked at all sorts of levels to try and get Farm Biz to come back in. Um, and that was a federal state collaboration. Um, and it was very successful. It brought, around, it brought about a lot of change in the 80s and 90s. Um, but I think that there's also probably a lack of understanding around change management because people think that if you go out and run a course and you teach somebody something, that's going to bring about change. It doesn't. <clears throat> it's that building of confidence. It's the support and it's the building of skills. And the skills and confidence take time to build. And so you've got to stay with them, which is generally about a four or five year journey to get people to where they're okay to go off and, you know, and then continue with that change. Um, so it's it's not a short term fix. It's It takes time. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we consider that if you wouldn't go to a dentist or a doctor who hadn't spent four or five years at university, you know, and, and yet we think that a two day or a three day program for a farmer is actually going to fix things like it's, it's ridiculous, you know, and the, the, um, the, the amount of knowledge and skills that farmers and graziers have to have is phenomenal. You know, they've got to be everything from a mechanic to an electrician to a, to a vet to, a, you know, to an accountant, um, to a grazing manager, you know, uh, plus all the practical skills. So there's, it's, um, and we're trying to bring new skills into this, into this mix, uh, which is not, it's not easy for any of us to learn new skills. You mentioned earlier about the challenges of attracting staff, be that an individual property and general staff shortages, especially skilled and you know high quality staff across the industry. Do you think there's more need for programs or education or, or other things to try and attract the right people into the industry? And what yeah, absolutely do you need what what do you think could be done in that space? Absolutely. So in Queensland, uh, 20 years ago, we had four agricultural colleges. Today, we have none. Um, all gone. And uh, the same and trend is education happening. is a priority. Yes, exactly. You know, and just recently, we had a good example where industry got together. There was one of these, the last of these colleges was going on the market from the state government. Um, and industry got together and put in a bid that they didn't even get their bid acknowledged, let alone opened or done anything else with. So, um, you know, they were, the industry was prepared to step up and I think they had 10 or 12 million in their pocket to buy this facility and do something with it. Um, and But the, the state government preferred that it was split up and sold off and some to do something else with. So, um, you know, there's, there's a complete disconnect uh, at this level. And I think also what's happened to training, you know, one of the reasons the colleges have shut down is that they're not like they used to be. And so kids voted with their feet. And when you looked at the stats, you'd see less and less and less people. To, you might have a college that used to have 150 people in it with 15 in it now. And so the state government looked at that and said, well, it, that's hopeless. But what they should have done was step back and said, why? And if you went to those colleges 25 or 30 years ago, you would have been breaking in horses, you'd have been working a chainsaw, you'd have been out on a motorbike, you'd have been doing, you'd have been doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and you would have been milking your own cows to provide your own breakfast, et cetera, et cetera, and slaughtering your own pigs for your own, you know, bacon, et cetera. Um, but what's happened is that the um, the the uh, vocational education sector stepped in and completely changed it into a 
box ticking approach to education. Um, and then because of OH&S, well, we cannot have children learning to use a chainsaw. You know, that's just too dangerous. We can't have them riding a motorbike. That's too dangerous. We can't have them spending too much time on a horse. That's too dangerous. Um, so the way in which the education was done changed to a level where it was completely useless for both the industry and the students. And the students and the industry voted with their feet. So instead of fixing up the way it's done, um, we got rid of the, the facilities. Uh, so, you know, um, the way, you know, but I think that there's possibilities to bring it back, but it does need some government support uh, to bring education back. And, you know, I've got a, a vision that I would like to see it, you know, and it's, it's based around a military model. So you, you start off as a private and then you, you earn some stripes and you become a corporal and a sergeant and so on. And you work your way up in skills and knowledge over a period of time, and it's essentially an apprenticeship, but with training on the side or with it that goes with it, depending on the level that you want to go to in the industry that you're in. And there is still room for the university graduates and so on back in the industry as well. But we need that apprenticeship model uh, brought back in and done in, the, in a good way. There's... A lot of talk, obviously, the soil carbon is a big thing. There's also the whole methane emissions space and what that the impact of that on the climate, um, the fact that the methane is a lost energy source, uh, so that could potentially be kept or more of that energy could be kept in the animal for production. Where do you see the balance or, or the priorities between, or do you see them both as high priorities, both within the methane space and the soil carbon space? I don't see methane as a priority at all. I think the whole methane debate is actually based on um, on, on falsehoods. Um, so, you know, to begin with, if we if you destock a property completely and said, right, there's no more methane being produced on that property, you would not change the emissions off that property. Um, you know, if, if that grass wasn't eaten by animals, it would be eaten by the termites which emit methane, it would be burnt or it would be oxidised. Animals are part of the carbon cycle. And so what, what's happened is that focusing on methane um, is actually focusing on the wrong end of the issue. And to put that in context, so these projects, soil carbon projects that we've just done, methane or total emissions and methane was a percentage of these emissions, but a big percentage, um, was 7.5% of the carbon of the CO2 sequestered. That says that methane is a, is a nothing in this story. So if you continue to focus on methane, um, it, it's like trying to treat some symptom that doesn't actually have a disease. Um, whereas if we get in and sequester carbon and put it into landscape, and use the animal to do that. Um, to, to, again, to put that in context, in these projects, the average across the four projects was that for every tonne of livestock these people carried over a five-year period, they sequestered nine tonnes of carbon dioxide into soil after accounting for methane and all other emissions. So the, in other words, the livestock on these properties is carbon negative to a tune of nine times the, the, the kilos, you know, or the tons of beef carried. So um, it, that just shows to me that the, the methane story is blown completely out of proportion. Um, so if, if we were to be real about methane, the first thing we would do is go out and measure what would going to be the methane emissions and or carbon dioxide emissions from this landscape before we put any animals on it. And that has not been done. So we're assuming that the animal is emitting methane, but if we took the animal away, there would be no methane, there'd be no CO2 emitted there, which is absolute rubbish. Because the, the methane, where did that, where did those carbon molecules come from that's in that methane? Come out of the atmosphere sometimes days before it was eaten. It goes back to the atmosphere. Methane's got a lifespan of 12 years compared to CO2, which has got a lifespan of 
of oh, 30 you know, of, a, of a thousand years rather so um i i don't place any store really on the methane story um and so what as i say i think we're going around treating symptoms of a disease that doesn't exist but let's focus on the reality if we want to make a difference to climate change let's pull co2 out of the air you know doing an avoided emission to me is like saying well there's a cliff in front of us um let's just put it in a second gear and continue to drive towards the cliff, which is what we're doing, right? Whereas if we say, let's put this carbon into soils, into vegetation, et cetera, and pull it out of the atmosphere and store it, um, then it's like saying, well, we're, we're gonna put it in reverse. But when, but when we put carbon in soil, it's worth far more than carbon in a tree. And the reason is to do with the relationship between soil organic carbon and water. Now, when you look at um, the greenhouse effect, about 70% of the greenhouse effect is due to water vapor. 25% of it is due to CO2 or in, in other forms of, of carbon, in very rough round figures. Now, when we put organic carbon into a soil, we store for every tonne of carbon, and that's carbon, not CO2, for every tonne of carbon we store in the soil, we store between four and 10 tonnes of water. So on one of these properties, he, scored, he stored 32,000 tonnes of carbon, soil organic carbon, in his soil over a five-year period, which is three and a half times that in terms of CO2. But that means that he, and using a ratio of six to one, being you know conservative about it, he has stored 200,000 tonnes of water in his soil. Now think about the impact on the greenhouse effect when you are taking water vapour out of the atmosphere. And just on the ratio of 25 to 70, 25% uh, CO2, 70%, uh, water vapour, one tonne of organic carbon stored in soil is equivalent to 20 tonnes of CO2 pulled out of the air in terms of its heating capacity. Now, you haven't pulled 20 tonnes of CO2 out of the air, but you've changed the heating capacity of the atmosphere by the equivalent of at least 20 tonnes of CO2. So to me, where we should be focusing on is how do we change the greenhouse effect? Not how do we stop an animal burping? You know, uh, that's a natural thing. So, uh, and if we put carbon and water into soils, what we will start to do is fix the small water cycle, which will give us more water stored in our landscapes, more resilience will be, these properties will be the last into drought and the first out of it. And that's actually happening right now. There's one in New South Wales. Um, he's got feed and grass to take him through to the end of this year. His neighbours have already got bare ground and are destocking. So that's the impact of putting carbon and, and water into your soil. Um, so my view is firmly that we need to be looking at how do you pull carbon or, or change the greenhouse effect as fast as you can. And soil carbon is the one way we can do that. We can do that globally and we can do it on scale. So that's all about building healthy, vibrant, um, biologically diverse living soils. Absolutely. And you see why that's where my focus is instead of methane. And I just, you can see I get a little bit excited when I start talking about methane. It, no, no, um, I, I love your passion. I love your passion. Yeah. I think there's many angles to that argument and i think um in terms of in terms of the ability to make a fast change quickly and you know we could just say everyone's going to stop driving cars no more planes are going to fly there's a whole lot of things if we can if we can decrease um it doesn't mean that it's not a natural process it doesn't mean it hasn't been going on for millions of years it is 
it, the, the an analogy is a bit like when you've got a hole, when the Titanic hit the iceberg and you got this hole, it's not about what caused it. It's about what you could do to plug it to stop the ship going down. And um, in terms of my perspective, I think there's opportunities for methane in that space. Um, but that's not at all to say that I don't agree with what you said in terms of the importance of the, the vibrant, healthy living soils. Yeah, and, and I agree that, you know, I'm not saying there's not some opportunities, particularly in feedlots and, and dairy, you know, in the intensive dairies and places like that um, to do something around methane. But uh, And it's not to say we shouldn't, but it's not going to solve anything uh, by focusing on it. You know, we've, we, we, I think so much of what we're doing in this whole climate change area is sort of uh, playing around with symptoms rather than really addressing issues. And again, it's a human issue. Where do you see the translatability um, between what's going on in Australia and other parts of the world, be that here in North America, Europe, and um, or Asia, Africa, South America? Um, that's a really, really good question. And we're very fortunate in Australia in that firstly, we have legislation that allows farmers to um, sell carbon from soils and vegetation and encourages them to do that. Secondly, we've got a regulator that regulates that. Thirdly, we've got methodologies that provide the rules that, that have a lot of integrity that allow us to do that. And finally, we have a market developing. Now, when I talk to people in Europe and US and so on and in other countries, they do not have that infrastructure. So it's a Wild West show. Anybody can stick their hand up and say, well, oh, yeah, I've, I've done this or I'm doing that or I can, and I, you know, um, I've made this practice change, therefore I've sequestered carbon. That, that's not real. And, you know, I think what we've got to be is very real. And um, so Australia is very fortunate. We actually lead the world. And I, and I know that there are other countries that are uh, looking at, our legislation, our structure, our regulation, all those sort of things, because without some form of regulation, this stuff's just going to uh, create a lot of greenwashing and a lot of problems. Um, whereas, you know, and our systems are difficult to deal with. They're very bureaucratic, and, I, and I'm not saying that we can't improve them and make them more farmer-friendly, <laughs> but we don't want to lose integrity when we do that. Um, you know, we're on our third soil carbon method now and we've got one that works finally but it's not necessarily ideal and we'll have another one next year we'll be on our fourth next year and hopefully we're starting to get somewhere but that's taken um where are we now uh, 2011 we got the legislation so we're 12 years down the track with 13 years next year and other countries are starting behind where we're already at um, so i think we've got a long way to go um, there's there's new technologies coming down the track that I think are going to make some of these measurements uh, you know cheaper, easier. Um, but we've got to be very careful about gaming the system or maintaining integrity in what we do because we want to make sure that whatever claims are being made, they are real and it's you know it's that it is impacting the climate. Your what you stated, they were very human uh, attributes, human infrastructure, policy infrastructure, rather than physical. So it's a, a human solution to a human challenge. Absolutely it is. Um, how many people are actually, you know, turning their air conditioners off at the moment and turning lights off more often and, and not having four televisions in their house and not having two cars in the garage? In the Western world, the population is not acting. So the way I see it is that the population wants somebody else to do something about climate change. And um, at this stage, not many other, you know, <laughs> not many other else is actually doing something about it. Um, and, and I think top-down government policy, it can give some guidance, but it won't make a difference at the end of the day. Uh, and, and so I think, Somehow or other, we've actually got to bring the people with us. And, you know, people will say, if you, are you concerned about climate change? Oh, yes. yes. You know, um, should we lower 
no, CO2 emissions. Oh, yes, yes. As long as my neighbour's doing it, somebody else is doing it, then, and I don't have to, uh, I'll put a few solar panels on my roof. That'll that'll help, and and maybe I'll get an electric car. You know, and and the electric car is symptom symptom treating in most cases because it's going to be plugged into a, um, you know, a, a coal fired power station. So, uh, and took probably a lot more energy to build that car of conventional energy uh, than what it's taking to build a normal car now. Because A, you've got a lot more aluminium. Aluminium is very, uh, you know, energy intensive. Uh, the production of the batteries is very energy intensive. You know, I, I saw a statistic recently. I think it was uh, the US Geological Society or something like that saying that we would need to build 25 new mines in each of about five minerals uh, globally in order to find the supply to build the number of batteries that people are talking about building. Most of those mining resources have not even been discovered yet, let alone uh, in a position to be mined. Um, and so you've got the processing of a lot of those minerals concentrated in one country, 80% uh, of the processing on most, uh, in building, batteries for vehicles, for example, is all concentrated in one country. So I think, you know, there's there's a lot that's got to be done yet that is, that we're not touching the surface. We are not touching the surface. And we, we haven't even delved into the geopolitical risk associated, which I think is a, right. it would be another whole discussion altogether. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. And the geopolitics have changed from... Five years ago, for sure. Yeah. So it, it's it's a big issue, but I believe that farmers can be a massive part of the solution. Um, but we need to globally put some effort into training them and educating them. Now, to me, a classic example is what's going on in Holland, and and you get it, you got it happening in Ireland now, and you've got other countries in New Zealand, you know, saying, well, let's just shut down the farms or we'll destock these animals to treat a symptom to a disease that doesn't exist. What should happen is those farmers should be taught how to farm with less nitrogen or zero nitrogen. Because in those instances, it's actually you know, it's nitrous oxide, which is the biggest issue, um, and not so much methane. It, it's how they're going about producing their livestock. But I could see, and the knowledge of how to do that is there. You know, there's examples all over the world of how you can actually run a dairy. Um, you know, there's a there's a good example in South Africa. There's a group of dairy farmers there that are now producing seven times the dry matter per hectare per year with 20% less water and zero nitrogen by focusing on soil health. So, you know, that it's happening in the real world. So. What's happened, you know, these farmers don't know that that's a possibility. They've only ever farmed using all this nitrogen. But, you know, the knowledge is there. But who's going to, well, let's just put them out of business and not worry about who, who's going to feed people in 20 years' time. That is so short sighted. Um, so, you know, and, and the farmers are up in arms. So they're wrong because they're not saying, well, they should be asking the question, well, how do we change? The government's wrong because they're just pointing the finger and saying, you guys are producing too much nitrous oxide and you're going to be out of business. So they're both wrong. And in the middle is, the, is an answer that will allow them to eliminate the nitrous oxide emissions, probably potentially reduce the methane emissions um, and improve their soils and take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere all at the same time. But what are we going to do? Shut them down. Like it's just, it's lunacy. Education. It is. And it's cheap. Like it's not, you haven't got to take them off their farms for four years and put them through university. You've got to take them off their farms for, you know, over a period of a year, maybe between a week and two weeks. You know, and, and, and set them up properly with the right, and it's got to be, you know, the right approach to this. Um, 
so they understand the ecological uh, benefits and, and the whole bit, the whole story. But it's possible, um, and unfortunately, there's you know we don't seem to want to go down that track. Gary, we're running out of time, but um, I'd just like to ask you if there's anything else that we haven't covered that you would like to add. I think um, you've covered it pretty well, but there's, there's potentially two risks for farmers that I can see at the moment coming down the track, and I call them the two big M's, and that's the money and the market. The market is already starting to want information on from their supply chains on what they're doing about reducing emissions and becoming and producing carbon neutral or you know product that's at least with less carbon in it. Um, and and I I work with work across a range of industries in agriculture, and I know that all these industries and their industry bodies are sitting back thinking, what are we going to do here? Like we're like deers in a headlight. We have no processes. We have no guidelines. There's no standards. Uh, and yet the market's starting to demand this stuff. And and also, and even the market, that's being pushed by the consumer end, but even the market doesn't know what it wants, measured or verified. Uh, and so that that's an issue. And then you've got the bank starting to do the same thing. Uh, and in Australia now, from we've got legislation now that says the big emitters in the 24-25 financial year will be required to start accounting for their emissions, including scope three. So that means that our big meatworks, for example, are going to go back to the farmers that supply them and say, right, you're my scope three emissions. What are you doing? And where's your evidence? So that I can pass that up my supply chain. So, and all of this is happening much faster than the ability or the interest in changing this at the individual farm level. So I think there's, you know, there's, there's it's a real crunch time heading. Um, and I, I think that might actually move along the change faster than, than uh, carbon credits might, but let's just see how it goes. Thank you very much, Terry. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you um, today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ash. Been enjoyable. Sorry for getting too excited. You've been listening to The Ash Cloud with me, Ash Sweeting, in conversation with Terry McCosker, recorded in California in August 2023.